Audiobook title Solis, An Ice Sky Adventure, 65 to 66, by Rowan. This work belongs to author Rowan, source scribblehub.com. Chapter 65, The Commander of the Knights of Solaris. If you like my work and want to support me, consider checking out my Patreon. Besides several chapters ahead of the public, you will also be helping me get closer to my dream of being a full-time writer. The free trial feature is currently active on my Patreon page through Rank S. If you're interested, you have the opportunity to enjoy reading up to six chapters ahead of the general public, for a duration of one week. As soon as the day dawned, I was already awake. After a little preparation, a horse was readied for me at the entrance of the castle. A soldier would guide me to the designated location of Solaris troops. As soon as I mounted the horse's back, I bid farewell to Amy and Rebecca. I had already said my goodbyes to the royalty yesterday before going to sleep which saved me a considerable amount of time that I would have spent talking to everyone. After finishing my farewells, I tapped the rider who would lead the horse, and the horse started to run. We left the castle's entrance, and headed toward the battlefield. Probably an hour had passed since we left the castle. We continued to follow the road until we reached an open field, much like Solaris and surrounded by mountains. We had to make many turns to get here. A large green plain stretched out before me. The cold wind beating against my face as we moved quickly on the horse woke up my senses. Even though it is technically summer, the snow-covered mountains surrounding Solaris make this country relatively cold even in summer. We can see it now. The soldier's voice brought me back from my thoughts. As I looked ahead, I could see several tents set up. Several soldiers were positioned in various places, while others walked around. It was quite apparent that the weather was not good at all. As we approached the two guards guarding the door, the guard leading our horse started talking to them. Meanwhile, I started looking around. Several soldiers were wearing armor and carrying swords or spears. Some were training with bows and arrows a little further away. Seconds later, the two guards cleared our passage, and we were soon inside. Here we are. Please go to the commander's tent. His tent is that bigger one over there, said the guard, pointing to a tent that was clearly larger than the others. All right, thank you. I said with a soft smile on my face. Thank you, Mr. Wren. Thanks to you, this may not be another lost war, said the soldier. After that, the soldier went off somewhere, leaving me alone. Looking at the commander's tent, I began walking towards it while looking around. As I glanced around, I saw an unrecognizable orange headdress. Eric? I asked, confused. Hearing my voice, the soldier who looked about my age turned around. As soon as I saw his face, my suspicion was confirmed. Run, what are you doing here? Eric asked, a confused look on his face. I could ask you the same question, I said, trying to understand the situation. Did he enlist or something? I thought as I looked at him. Before I could ask anything else, a male voice echoed from behind me. Excuse me, would you be Mr. Wren? As I turned around, I saw a bespectacled man wearing a uniform without armor. He was looking at me while carrying a notebook in his hand. Both his hair and eyes were black. That's me, I said raising an eyebrow. Oh, I finally found you, the man said. The commander told me to come get you in case you got lost, said the man, turning around. Please follow me. After that, he started walking towards the biggest tent. I have to go now. I'll talk to you later, I said. As soon as I turned to Eric, he just nodded, and soon I started to follow the man from before. As we walked, I tried to initiate a conversation with the man. Um, it's a pleasure. I think you already know, but my name is Rin, I said as friendly as possible. Oh, I'm sorry for the late introduction. My name is Glenn, said the man, introducing himself with a gentle smile. It's a pleasure, I replied with another smile. After that, the two of us made our way to the tent where the army commander would be. As soon as he opened the tent, a huge table in the center caught my attention. Looking up from the table, I saw that there was a map probably of the place we were in. There were a few men sitting at the table, and they all stopped the conversation they were having as soon as Glenn and I entered. Commander, I brought Mr. Wren, Glenn said. Hearing Glenn's words, a man who was in the center stood up with a smile on his face. With his blonde hair and black eyes, he had a very handsome appearance. He was quite muscular, indicating that he trained regularly. On his cheek, there was a cut giving him the look of a veteran soldier. After standing up, the man walked over to me and asked for a handshake. It's a pleasure, boy. My name is John. I am the commander of the Knights of the Solaris Kingdom, 
said the man with a welcoming smile. For some reason, the feeling of going to war left my body completely, and my tension suddenly eased, making me more comfortable. Although I found this strange, I decided to ignore it for now. It's a pleasure, sir. My name is Rin, I said in a polite manner as I shook his hand. But contrary to all my thoughts, he grabbed my arm and started to quickly swing it up and down, leaving me bewildered for a moment. Ha ha ha, why all this formality, boy? No one here is good with that. Besides, you must be my daughter's age. Just call me John, said the man with a smile. Although I didn't fully understand the situation, I understood that this man was quite friendly, which made me even more at ease. Understood, John, I said with a smile on my face. Ha ha ha, now that's better, John said, turning to the other people who were looking at our interaction at the table. All right, now that everyone is here, let's start the meeting said John with a serious expression on his face. My Discord server for conversations and pictures of the protagonists of my works, as well as possible spoilers of my future stories. 4. Chapter 66. The Plan. Next. If you like my work and want to support me, consider checking out my Patreon. Besides several chapters ahead of the public, you will also be helping me get closer to my dream of being a full-time writer. The free trial feature is currently active on my Patreon page through Rank S. If you're interested, you have the opportunity to enjoy reading up to six chapters ahead of the general public, for a duration of one week. After John's words, the meeting began. First, John talked about the enemies we would face in general, their number, strength, endurance, and their commander. Listening to his words, I could easily see that this would be a difficult battle, since the commander will usually be at the front of his army it is unlikely that the gas will spread to that part. So, John will face the enemy commander if need be. Another point to mention is that the enemy commander seems to be quite famous, even though I have never heard of him. As soon as his name was pronounced at the meeting, everyone's tension rose instantly. After this, a soldier brought a map at John's request and placed it on the table. John began to circle important points in red, such as where we were, where the enemy would be, and the extent of his army among other things. After this, John looked at me and asked, Where do you think would be a good place to fire those? What are they called again? John asked, putting his hand to his chin, trying to remember. They are called gas grenades, sir, Glenn said as he sighed. That's right, that was the name. So, which places should we prioritize spreading this gas? John asked with a serious expression. I was really surprised they were taking a child's word seriously. But probably because we are in a war. They are deliberately ignoring my age. Looking at the map, the best places are here, I said, marking a total of 16 locations. That will allow the gas to spread a lot and join with the others. But probably the gas won't make it to the front, I said thoughtfully. No matter how I looked at it, the way I positioned the grenades was the best possible. As I was thinking about this, John suddenly asked me something I wasn't expecting. Kid, have you ever killed anyone? John asked with a serious expression. Even though I didn't understand the real reason for his question, I decided to answer anyway. Never, sir, I said confused. Hearing my words, John seemed to get thoughtful for a few seconds. Okay, in that case, stay behind me when we are in battle. I promise you won't have to get your hands dirty if you stay with me. It's the adult's job to protect the children, said John with a confident smile on his face. Hearing his words, the tension mysteriously lowered. By this... I had realized what kind of man John was. With a smile on my face, I looked at John. You don't have to worry about me, sir. I came here prepared for this. After all, this is a war. If I don't have that mentality, we will never win, I said with a smile on my face. I didn't think I could kill someone so easily. But I know that in a world where death is everywhere, this is something that will have to happen sooner or later. The best thing would be to gain experience while I still can. Hearing my words, John looked at my face for a few seconds before a smile opened on his face. I like your determination. I remember I was exactly like that when I tried to confess to my wife, said John, smiling as he looked up as if remembering the old days. Since when did this become a conversation about relationships, Captain? Ha, said one of the men who was sitting at the table, smiling. Besides, everyone here knows that you almost begged her to marry you, said another man with a smile on his face. In a few seconds, the somber atmosphere had turned into a cheerful and lively one. What, I'm still the commander of you guys, okay? Said John, sounding irritated, 
although a small smile could be seen on his lips. Well kid, as you may have already realized, you don't need to be that tense. Here we are all like one big family, John said smiling. After this, the meeting was over, the plan was clear, and everyone already knew their positions. Now we just need to wait a few more hours until everything begins. The enemy army should appear on the horizon in about an hour. As this place is surrounded by a few high points, it will be easy to shoot arrows from long distances if the shooters are proficient. The fact that they are ignoring this will be the reason for their defeat. It has to be. I thought as I walked around the camp. After spending a few minutes walking, I finally find the person I was looking for. Eric, I said catching the attention of the orange-haired young man. As soon as he turned around, a big smile appeared on his face. Rin, Eric said, running towards me. It's good to see you here, said Eric. For some reason, he seemed a little tense. Well, I guess that's normal, seeing that we are about to enter a war. I say the same, but what are you doing here? I asked, confused. Although I knew Eric had a dream of being a knight, I didn't expect him to get stuck in the first war that occurred. When I heard rumors about the war, I tried anyway to enlist. I thought if I helped in something, no matter how small, you, Flora, Princess Emmy, and my parents would be a little safer. I can't get that feeling out of my chest, that something bad is going to happen, Eric said with a strange expression on his face that made me a little surprised. The two of us haven't even known each other that long, and even then, it was a surprise to know that I was among the people he wanted to protect. But what are you doing here anyway? I saw that they took you to the commander's tent, Eric asked, confused. Well, you don't have to worry so much anymore, I said, causing Eric to raise a confused eyebrow. What do you mean by that? Eric asked. Even though I am still not guaranteed, we now have a way to win this war by having a minimum number of casualties. I said with a serious look on my face. My Discord server for conversations and pictures of the protagonists of my works, as well as possible spoilers of my future stories. 2. Audiobook titled DC Phantom Thief Kid, 36-41, by Sithosk. This work belongs to author Sithosk. Source Scribblehub.com. Chapter 36, Bad Girl. Never forget what you are. The rest of the world will not. Tyrion Lannister got. Meanwhile, in Wayne Manor's underground, the Batcave, Dick walked in with Alfred through a secret entrance with bags. They were surprised to find someone already in the Batcave. But this person wasn't tall, or even male. Clearly, it wasn't Batman who had returned. It was a young red-haired girl wearing a bat-themed helmet and a tight-fitting black suit with a bat symbol on her chest. She was looking for some information while she sat in front of the huge bat computer. In some ways, she looked more like Batman's partner than the red, green, and yellow-cloaked Robin. She was Batgirl, the new street hero who recently appeared in Gotham as the fourth member of the Bat family. To be honest, she didn't really like the name Batgirl. She wanted to be called Batwoman, even though she had just turned 18 two months ago. But for some reason, when she first appeared in the newspaper, the media called her Batgirl. Hey Alfred, and little elf boots, you're back. Seeing that Alfred and Dick had returned, Batgirl greeted them. Hey, we agreed not to call me elf boots. Dick was not happy with the nickname Batgirl used to call him, and he twitched. Is that so? I don't remember making any agreements with anyone. Maybe when you finally change those childish green boots, I'll think about it. Batgirl spread her hands and said it with a smirk. Everyone in the circus wears these boots. I'm not changing them. Well, yeah, the shape is kind of funny, but that's its charm. Dick raised an eyebrow. I'm glad to see you, Miss Gordon. Alfred smiled and said to Batgirl, If the GCPD heard his name, they would definitely look at Batgirl carefully because their respected commissioner's last name was Gordon. Moreover, Commissioner Gordon also had a daughter who had recently turned 18, the same age as Batgirl. That's right, Batgirl's real identity was none other than Commissioner Gordon's daughter Barbara Gordon. It seems like you two have been busy today. Would you like some late night dinner? Looking at the thick files in the bat computer in front of Bacco, it was obvious that he would have to work for a long time, so Alfred suggested. Thank you so much, Alfred. Because of some jerk, I didn't even have time for dinner, and now I'm starving. A surprised expression appeared on Bacco's face, and she said gratefully, No need to thank me. It's my pleasure. Alfred turned and headed towards the kitchen to prepare some food and coffee for Batgirl and Dick. Meanwhile, Dick placed the bag in a corner against the wall. There was a huge cabinet there with hundreds of small glass cases, each one protected by ultra-strong glass. 
In the cabinet, there are many items stored, all of which are strange and rare things. There were two-faced coins, Riddler's cane, Killer Croc's teeth, Scarecrow's mask, Harley Quinn's baseball bat, and many more. These are all items that Batman and Robin have collected from different enemies. Most of them were collected due to some strange collecting addiction, and a small number of special items were put into the GCPD evidence room because they were more dangerous. Batman couldn't trust others to keep them safe, so he took them back himself. Dick took out a white cloak from his handbag and placed it in an empty cabinet case. Batgirl noticed his actions and asked curiously, I heard you've been having a heated battle with that popular phantom thief recently. Is this his cloak? What a strange word you used. Dick couldn't help but comment. I just heard from Alfred that you seem to have a good impression of Phantom Thief. Aren't you afraid Batman will get angry if he finds out? Batgirl shrugged. You know he never likes us to judge criminals based on personal feelings. Ha ha. Dick gave a strange laugh. I used to believe that too until I learned about his history with Catwoman. Batgirl was amused by what Dick said. You know what? I totally agree with you, but... Batgirl then turned to the back computer, facing away from Dick. I can actually understand why Bruce would always be soft on Catwoman, especially after seeing her in person once. Wow, she's a smoking hot beauty. As for Phantom Thief, the more he listened, the more uneasy Dick felt. He crossed his arms over his chest, and his face grew serious. What do you mean? Nothing. I'm just thinking, if I told your girlfriend at the Titan Tower about this, would she believe it? Batgo smirked, making Dick's eyelids twitch. I'm just kidding. Don't take it seriously. By the way, did you run into any troublemakers today? Need my help? Dick asked suddenly. No need, I can handle it by myself. Honestly, I'm more worried if you need my help dealing with Phantom Thief. Batgirl turned her head to look at the back computer and said with her back to Dick. You've faced him twice already and still got no useful information. His real name, age, appearance, job, and life history are all blank. There's already one file on him in the back computer's database and we don't need a second one, Batgirl said. That's because you haven't fought Phantom Thief yourself. If you have, you'll know how difficult he is to deal with. Dick folded his hands on his chest, with a serious face, and said, He is very smart, maybe not as smart as Riddler, but he also doesn't have the obsessive-compulsive disorder that the Riddler likes to leave clues for the enemy. It's hard to figure out Phantom Thief's plans. Also, Phantom Thief's disguising techniques are very clever. If it weren't for the fact that I saw him tearing off the disguised mask of William with my own eyes, I might have thought he had shape-shifting powers like Clayface, Dick explained. But Phantom Thief's acting is even better than Clayface. Unless you know every small detail of the person and can see his flaws, it's impossible to directly recognize his disguise. Phantom Thief is very cautious and knows all about the police's arrangements and monitoring systems. He doesn't leave any trace and can even avoid all the surrounding surveillance, Dick continued. The only clue we have is that Phantom Thief's identity might be a magician, but there are too many magicians in Gotham, and we don't even know his age. So it's impossible to identify him. Dick shook his head with a bitter smile. I once asked a professional magician to help investigate Phantom Thief's suspects based on his magical skills, and then I got 20 candidates. But after checking them one by one, I found that none of them could be Phantom Thief. Batgirl slowly became interested as she listened to Dick's description. Is it really that difficult to deal with this Phantom Thief as you say? Patreon.com slash You can find up to 20 advanced chapters at my Patreon. 8. Chapter 37. Gotham City Public Library. Life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while you can miss it. Ferris Bueller. Believe me, if you've seen Phantom Thief once you'll know that I'm not making things up. Dick said this seriously to Batgirl. Are you sure? You can handle it alone? You don't need my help? Batgirl asked with a questioning look. I told you I don't need your help. Can we stop talking about Phantom Thief for a moment? What are you investigating right now? Dick changed the subject. He walked over to Batgirl and looked at the huge screen of the Bat computer. Let me see. Garfield Linz. Firefly? Seeing the name displayed in the Bat file, Dick asked in surprise. Yeah, remember when he and that stupid killer moth set fire to the GCPD headquarters. It was me who clearly defeated the two of them. But in the end, the newspaper said it was you and Batman who did it. Hearing this, Dick smiled awkwardly and said, Um, you know, in our line of work, we shouldn't care about fame and credit. 
as long as the bad guys are stopped, it doesn't matter who did it, right? In fact, it wasn't about Dick and Batman taking credit away from Batgirl that day. Even though Batgirl had already taken down Killer Moth and Firefly by the time they got there, she wasn't in good shape herself at the time. So, the task of taking Firefly and Killer Moth into custody fell to Batman and Robin. Since there were no witnesses to the entire battle, the police and the media only saw Batman and Robin, and they didn't even know what Batgirl had done. With Batman's personality, he wouldn't go out of his way to tell anyone that Batgirl actually caught the criminals. Suit yourself, Batgirl replied calmly. Cough, cough. Dick coughed twice and curiously asked, after that incident, didn't Firefly and Killer Moth get sent to Arkham Asylum? Why are you digging into their old files again? A few weeks ago, a district attorney proposed to reopen the GCPD arson case. He thinks that the psychological analyses of Firefly and Killer Moth aren't clear enough, and that they might have been faked. So they were preparing to transfer the two of them to Blackgate Penitentiary for imprisonment. Batgirl explained. That doesn't sound like a bad thing, Dick said. I thought so too until I received some really bad news yesterday. Firefly escaped. Dick furrowed his brow tightly. How did he escape? What about Killer Moth? Who knows? When a prison guard made his morning rounds, he suddenly discovered that Firefly was missing. There were no signs, and the surveillance didn't catch anything. As for Killer Moth, he's still in prison. Maybe Firefly had a falling out with him. Batgirl shrugged helplessly. I've been tracking Firefly after hearing about this. I hacked into Gotham's entire surveillance system and found over 30 locations where he was spotted. I spent the whole day checking those places, even dealt with several criminals on the streets. I couldn't find Firefly. So, I came back to check the bat files and look through the bat files to see if I could guess the possible places he would go from Firefly's past experiences. You know, the information in the bat computer is much more detailed than the GCPD's database. Dick nodded and suggested, I can help you with some of that. In fact, you can't, Master Richard. At this point, Alfred came over and interrupted him with two plates of chicken sandwiches and two cups of coffee. I'm sorry to have to remind you, but you still have homework to complete. Alfred is right. A young boy like you who's still in school should go and finish your assignments obediently, or else be careful of Bruce coming back to spank you. Bacchel said it with a sly smile. If you encounter any difficult problems that you can't solve, feel free to ask me for help, she added. Dick glanced at her and didn't argue back because he knew that he couldn't really compete with the girl in front of him when it came to studying. At 16 years old, Dick was still in his fourth year at Gotham Academy, waiting to take this year's ACT or SAT exams. While 18-year-old Batgirl had already graduated from Gotham University six months ago with a PhD in library management. Grabbing a sandwich and stuffing it into his mouth, Dick went to the side to finish his schoolwork while Batgirl continued with her task. After a while, Batgirl finished reviewing all the files and stretched lazily before getting up from her chair and walking towards the Batcave's garage. I'm heading back now, see you tomorrow, Alfred and Elf Boots, Batgirl said as she hopped onto a bat cycle, said goodbye to Alfred and Dick, and then left the Batcave. The night passed without much incident. The next day, Sunday. Gotham Burnley District, Sutton Manor. When Dean woke up and got out of bed, it was already 9.30 o'clock in the morning. After getting ready, he had a simple breakfast and left the house. Dean had a very important plan to do today, so he was planning to go to Gotham City Public Library. Of course, he didn't go there to do school research. Although Dean had schoolwork just like Dick, and he hadn't even started on it yet, he wasn't worried at all. In his previous life, he could even finish summer homework in a single night with just a pen. This weekend's schoolwork was nothing to Dean. The reason he was going to the library was actually to prepare a new notice letter. It must be said that writing the notice letter was really difficult. It had to be cleverly mysterious, not too direct, but also not too much. It had to be difficult enough to decipher but also not impossible to figure out. This forced Dean to learn a lot of unknown knowledge that normal people would never bother to learn so as to have more knowledge to use when writing the notice letter. On the way, he also took care of a fake pink fantasy and threw it into a random garbage can. Arriving at the library, Dean went straight to the section on ancient religious mythology. He picked up a book with a mysterious cover and started flipping through it while standing there. As he was reading, a surprised voice suddenly came from the aisle to Dean's left. An introduction to Greco-Roman polytheism? 
I didn't expect anyone to be interested in that kind of book. Dean turned his head and saw a red-haired girl wearing glasses staring at him in surprise, and at the book in his hand. The girl looked a year or two older than Dean, with a tall and well-attractive figure. She was wearing a white uniform with a name tag that read Library Administrator. She was pushing a cart full of books, apparently organizing them. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I didn't mean to disturb you while you were reading. I was just so surprised because from the first day, I started working here until now, I've never seen anyone looking for and reading books from this section. Noticing Dean's gaze, the girl immediately realized that she might have interrupted him and quickly apologized. Author's note, guys I think it will be Cassandra Cain or Barbara Gordon, but there's no progress yet so let's see. Patreon.com slash you can find up to 20 advanced chapters at my Patreon. 9. Chapter 38 Barbara No one notices your sadness until it turns into anger, and then you're the bad person. Unknown. Don't worry, there aren't many people coming to this library in Gotham, and even fewer people are interested in reading boring books. So it's already good that you didn't mistake me for a suspicious robber. Dean spoke calmly as he closed the book and put it back on the shelf. Besides, I was just planning to leave and get something to eat. Dean continued, realizing it was already close to 1.30 in the afternoon. So it's not really a regular meal time. But Dean ate breakfast quite late, so he wasn't very hungry. He had been reading for a while and had lost track of time. Dean might have kept reading longer if the librarian girl hadn't spoken up just now. Is that so? Well then, I have to recommend the dining area in our library to you. I swear in my father's name that the cheese rolls they sell there are the best in all of Gotham, and the best part is that they are affordable. So, I really suggest you give it a try. The girl eagerly recommended the library's food to Dean when she heard that he was going to eat. Dean wondered if the cheese rolls were really that good, or if she was just trying to attract customers to the library. This kind of library shouldn't need help from the government to keep running, right? But maybe they hired someone else to run the dining area or they just wanted to make a little extra money. However, he didn't bother thinking too much about it. He dismissed these meaningless thoughts, as he wasn't interested in such matters. If the police commissioner's daughter highly recommends the food, then it can't be that bad. In that case, let me go and try it, Dean said as he got up and headed towards the dining area in the library. Wait, what did you say just now? The librarian girl hurriedly grabbed Dean and asked in shock. Do you know me? No. This is our first meeting. Then how do you know my identity? The girl looked at Dean suspiciously. It's simple. The requirements for hiring librarians at Gotham City Public Library are much higher than in regular libraries, and employees can enjoy government benefits. Unless you have studied library management in college or have parents who are public servants, it's rare for someone to qualify for a formal position here. Additionally, the color of your employee badge is dark blue which means you have a higher rank than other librarians here. Dean explained it naturally. It is impossible for ordinary people at your age to get this position. But what does that have to do with being the police commissioner's daughter? Can't I be the daughter of any government official? The girl asked with suspicion. Dean smiled faintly and replied, In Gotham, officials are usually not very clean. Their children would not be interested in a low-paying job like being a librarian, which has many benefits, but an extremely low salary. It is even more impossible for them to endure the hardship of practicing martial arts all year round. You, on the other hand, have a different background. You have trained in martial arts, maybe judo or karate. This can be seen in the calluses on your hands and the tight muscles on your legs. That type of physique is different from someone who just works out. It's developed from years of hard work and hitting hard objects. It shows that you are very focused and have been practicing for a long time. Unlike those rich second generations who take martial arts classes, they usually do it for fun and wouldn't achieve the same level of body as you. Dean continued, especially in the world of DC Comics, if any wealthy or official second generation member seriously learns martial arts, it's 100% sure that they will become a vigilante or superhero. But there aren't many superheroes, so seeing one is not something you can see every day. With the environment in Gotham, it's rare for families to send their daughters to learn combat techniques systematically. Those who are often focused on the political and legal systems, like police officers, lawyers, and judges, have a better understanding of the city's hidden darkness than ordinary people. They are also wealthier than ordinary families, so they would want you to have the power to protect yourself. After all, 
They can't keep their daughters at home forever. As the conversation went on, the girl's interest was slowly aroused. According to what you said, even if my parents possibly work in the political and legal system, why do you think it's Commissioner Gordon? There are other police officers who have daughters as well. The girl asked with curiosity. Well, that's where my friend comes in. He has a lot of sources of information and once told me about Commissioner Gordon's genius daughter who graduated from Gotham University with a doctorate in library management at the age of 18. It is obvious that it is you, Dean shrugged, raising an eyebrow. He wasn't lying. This friend was actually Dick, and they had known each other for many years and often talked about things they knew. Dick always complained to Dean about the corruption among the city's high-ranking officials, while Dean would reveal some secrets of magic to Dick. Dick had mentioned Commissioner Gordon's daughter during one of these discussions. But Dean hadn't paid much attention to it, and he didn't know that Barbara was Batgirl. The girl fell silent for a moment and said, So, you actually knew that my father is Jim Gordon, and everything you said earlier was just nonsense? Dean smiled slightly and said, Why call it nonsense? Did I say something wrong? Okay, fine. Your observation skills are amazing. You should become a private detective. I'm Barbara Gordon. May I ask what your name is? Barbara introduced herself officially and then asked for Dean's name. Nice to meet you, Ms. Gordon. I'm Dean Sutton, and this is a little gift for our first meeting. Dean stretched out his hand and snapped his fingers, and a pink rose appeared out of thin air. He slightly bowed and handed the flower to Barbara. Oh, thank you. You can do magic tricks as well? Barbara graciously accepted the rose, slightly surprised. Conjuring a rose is not a rare technique. It can be considered a basic skill that every magician knows. But because of this, it is harder to do it, especially in front of an audience with sharp eyes. Batgirl's eyesight clearly fell into the category of excellent eyesight. Barbara could see through most close-up magic tricks at a glance. But when Dean conjured the rose just now, Barbara couldn't understand his technique at all. It's not that she didn't understand, but that she couldn't see it. Barbara knew the method behind this magic trick and she could even perform it successfully herself. But it was basically impossible to do it, to the level that Dean's trick cannot be seen at all. But Dean doesn't know that Barbara is Batgirl because there are too many Batgirl versions of DC Comics, like Betty Kane, Cassandra Kane, Stephanie Brown and more. Now that I think about it, I seem to have heard the name Sutton somewhere before. I remember now. You're the famous young prodigy magician. Barbara suddenly seemed to recall something. Grayson mentioned you before. Wait a minute, you said your friend told you about Commissioner Gordon's daughter? Could it be? Yes, you guessed right. My friend is Dick Grayson. Dean admitted it frankly. Patreon.com slash You can find up to 20 advanced chapters at my Patreon. 7. Chapter 39. Dragon's Egg Ruby Necklace. If you don't share someone's pain, you can never understand them. Nagato, Naruto. Gotham City Public Library. Dining Area. It's hard to imagine why a library would have a dining area. Who would be hungry while reading here? It is very common for a library and a coffee shop to be together, as it's more in line with the normal habit of reading and having coffee at the same time. When Dean first entered the dining area, he found the surroundings surprisingly nice. Although there weren't many customers eating here, the whole place was very clean and tidy. The decor was simple and looked like that of McDonald's. In fact, compared to a restaurant for new customers, Dean felt that this place was more like the cafeteria of the library. There were obviously more people wearing librarian uniforms than those who came to read books, which may also be the reason why the meal time has passed. At this moment, a waiter walked over with a tray of food and placed it on Dean's table. Sir, this is your order for the cheese and beef roll combo. Enjoy your meal. The combo meal consisted of two beef rolls, a serving of french fries, and a glass of freshly squeezed lemonade. The cheese beef rolls were much larger than McDonald's chicken rolls, and the whole combo meal was quite good and affordable. According to Barbara's recommendation of the food being of good quality and a reasonable price, so far it seems she was right. Thank you. Dean thanked the waiter, but instead of immediately eating, he looked at the red-haired girl sitting across the table. So, why did you come along, Miss Gordon? Dean asked with a strange expression on his face. Aren't you supposed to be organizing all those books on the book cart? Actually, that wasn't my job in the first place. Barbara shrugged with boredom, saying, As you said, my position is one level higher than the other librarians, so my tasks are not about organizing books. Instead, 
I manage the librarians, even though there aren't many people for me to manage here. I pushed the cart to organize the books just now mainly because I had nothing else to do and wanted to help the other staff a bit. Barbara smirked and added, but now that I see someone more interesting than organizing books, so I came over. Wow, I'm flattered, Dean exaggeratedly replied. You probably won't believe how famous you are. When I was still a student in school, almost every female classmate dreamed of having your autographed photo. Even though I was too busy preparing for my thesis for early graduation and didn't have the time to pay attention to magic shows or anything like that, I still constantly hear your name from time to time. Barbara's face was serious. The title of Gotham's genius young magician was quite impressive. Especially when Dean had a handsome and charming face, it attracted even more young female fans. If this was the case at the Gotham University where Barbara was, it's easy to imagine how terrible it would be at the high school Dean himself was in. Dean couldn't remember how many girls wanted to date him, but he had always rejected all of them. Whenever on Valentine's Day, Dean's locker or drawers in school would be filled with piles of confession letters, flowers, and chocolates, which had always been a source of distress for him. This situation also made the boys at school generally unfriendly towards Dean, so he usually only hung out with Dick. It wasn't until Dean basically stopped performing on stage in the past two years and his reputation slowly declined that his situation improved a lot. Genius young magician? That's all in the past, just an empty reputation. There are plenty of magicians out there who are more better than me. Dean took a bite of his cheese beef roll and chewed it before swallowing. He said, like the Zatara family from Gotham City, both of them are top-notch magicians. The younger is even younger than me and he is considered the number one prodigy magician in Gotham. Eating alone can be a bit boring, so Dean started chatting with Barbara. Now that you've tried the cheese beef roll, how does it taste? Is it amazing? Barbara suddenly looked expectantly at Dean and asked. Um, it's pretty good. Dean was a bit unsure of how to respond to the question and pondered for a moment before giving an honest answer. Overall, the taste was good. At least Dean didn't find any issues with it. It might be slightly better than a regular cheese beef roll. As for whether it was the best cheese beef roll in Gotham, it's hard to say. After all, Dean hadn't tried rolls from other places. In short, Dean gave his ratings. I told you the recipe was good. Surprisingly, when Barbara heard Dean's response, she said excitedly, You don't know, a few days ago, the head chef decided to change the recipe for the cheese beef roll. She thought changing the flavor would attract more customers to eat but it was a disaster. Speaking up to this point, Barbara glanced at the counter discreetly, then leaned closer to Dean and whispered, You haven't tried the other foods in the restaurant, so you don't understand, but believe me, the only thing worth eating here is this beef roll. If they really change the recipe, I'm afraid I'll have to order takeout every day. But if customers give feedback that the cheese beef roll is delicious, it could convince her not to change the current recipe. Unfortunately, very few people order this food. Luckily, you came today. Upon hearing this, Dean fell into deep thought. I don't know why, but suddenly I feel that the cheese beef roll on the plate tastes different. At the same time, the Diamond District of Gotham, an area filled with wealthy people, it is the safest part of the city. It is also the Penguin Stronghold, where the Iceberg Lounge is located. Yes, you heard it right. The place where Penguin lives is the safest part of Gotham City than the GCPD headquarters and the old Gotham district where the city government lives. Inside the Iceberg Lounge, a woman who appeared to be in her forties, perfectly dressed from head to toe, nervously walked into Penguin's office. She wore a diamond necklace around her neck, but the diamonds were not the focus of the necklace. Instead, they played a supporting role. The real treasure was a huge oval-shaped ruby, the size of a palm hanging from the necklace, a priceless gem. In the office, Penguin sat alone at his desk, looking at her with a smile on his face. Welcome to the Iceberg Lounge, Mrs. Chandler. What do you want from me, Oswald? Mrs. Chandler took a deep breath, mustered her courage, and coldly asked, Don't be so rude. I never asked my men to capture you. I simply had them invite you over. Penguin still maintained his smile, his gaze fixed on Mrs. Chandler's chest. I have to say, You've taken good care of yourself. I remember you're over 60 now, yet you still look so young. It seems those legends about the dragon's egg ruby necklace maintain your youth is true. Seeing Penguin's gaze focused on her necklace, Mrs. Chandler's expression immediately changed. Save it, Oswald. 
I will never let you take it away. You misunderstand me too deeply. I'm a businessman, not a criminal. Why would I want to take away your most beloved necklace? Penguin shook his head slightly and looked like he was ashamed. Mrs. Chandler, your necklace is one of Gotham's most famous treasures, yet it has never been publicly exhibited. So many people can only imagine what it looks like, don't you think it's a pity? What are you trying to say? Mrs. Chandler said coldly. I just believe that the people of Gotham have the right to see this city's treasure with their own eyes. Penguin smiled lightly and kindly said, So I've decided to hold an exhibition soon, and I hope you can agree to exhibit this dragon's egg ruby necklace. Patreon.com slash Sothisku. You can find up to 20 advanced chapters at my Patreon. 7. Chapter 40. Breaking News. Be the change that you wish to see in the world. Mahatma Gandhi. Gotham City Public Library. Dining Area. In the middle of a casual conversation with Barbara, Dean finished his cheese beef roll combo. A news broadcast suddenly interrupted the Big Bang Theory that was currently playing on an old hanging television in the cafeteria. This is Gotham Channel 7, I'm your host, Rasai White, and we have a breaking news report. At this moment, we are interviewing in front of one of Gotham's oldest families, the current matriarch of the Chandler family, Mrs. Evelyn Chandler. Just an hour ago, Mrs. Chandler announced some exciting news. She has decided to publicly exhibit the Chandler family's heirloom, the dragon's egg ruby necklace, which has been passed down through the Chandler family for centuries. This is the first time the Chandler family has agreed to exhibit this necklace to the outside world. It is rumored that a total of 130 diamonds are placed around this necklace to set off the huge ruby hanging on it. This treasure is said to have the power to keep one forever young. Many people believe that Mrs. Chandler, who is in her 60s, looks at least 20 years younger than she looks because of wearing this necklace. It is not known whether it is true or not. Upon hearing this breaking news, Dean's heart moved, and he seemed to look at the TV by accident as he lifted his head. Barbara also turned her head to watch the TV, and the two of them made the same movements at the same time, although Barbara's movements were perhaps a bit faster. So this is what they mean by girls can't resist the attraction of jewelry? Dean looked at the back of Barbara's head and thought to himself. In other news, the Phantom Thief, who has been very active in Gotham recently has committed crimes twice in a row. Why did Mrs. Chandler decide to exhibit the Dragon's Egg Ruby necklace at this time? Now let's switch to the live scene of the press conference. As soon as the news anchor, Risai White, finished speaking, the TV screen switched to a bustling square. There were numerous reporters surrounding Mrs. Chandler, and cameras were flashing non-stop. Mrs. Chandler, you've always been against publicly exhibiting the Dragon's Egg Ruby necklace. What made you change your mind? A familiar blonde female reporter squeezed her way to the front row and raised her microphone to ask Mrs. Chandler. This reporter was none other than Vicky Vale. She was indeed Gotham's most famous star reporter, and she was always seen on almost every hot topic in Gotham. There's no particular reason. It's just that after growing older, I've come to realize many things that I was obsessed with in my youth. Mrs. Chandler spoke calmly. Her expression was comfortable as if these words were truly from her heart. The Dragon's Egg Ruby Necklace is not only a family heirloom but also a treasure of Gotham. While I can't go against my ancestors' wishes and donate it to a museum, I believe that all the people of Gotham have the right to see this treasure with their own eyes. So, Mrs. Chandler's eyes flashed with a hidden strangeness, but she quickly covered it up. I decided to invest with the Copperpot family to hold a grand exhibition at the Natural History Museum. The exhibition will run from March 1st to the 15th, and all tickets will be sold at a 30% discount during the exhibition. As soon as her announcement came out, the audience was in an uproar. There is nothing wrong with the exhibition, which runs for half a month, and there is nothing wrong with paying 30% off the tickets. It is not also a big problem to choose the exhibit at the Natural History Museum. However, co-sponsoring the event with the Cobblepot family was a different issue. The Cobblepot family was considered an old wealthy in Gotham and used to have a higher status than the Chandler family. Unfortunately, their former glory had long faded, and the Cobblepot family now only had Oswald Cobblepot. Everyone knew he had another identity, a chilling one, Penguin. Why would Penguin co-sponsor an exhibition with the Chandler family? Mrs. Chandler, Oswald Cobblepot is currently under investigation for alleged money laundering by authorities. Aren't you afraid of any consequences for cooperating with him? Vicky continued her questioning. 
Mrs. Chandler glanced at her calmly and replied, Please mind your words, Ms. Reporter. As far as I know, there's no evidence to prove Oswald's involvement in money laundering. If you continue making such careless comments, I'll have security escort you out. Well, if you insist, I apologize for my words. If I may, I have one final question for you. Seeing Mrs. Chandler's attitude, Vicky's eyes flickered, and she finally asked, Mrs. Chandler, have you heard of the The Phantom Thief? He is a notorious jewel thief who has been active in Gotham recently. Aren't you worried that he might target your necklace? I am aware of this thief, but I am not afraid. I have full confidence in the future security measures for the exhibition. Mrs. Chandler spoke with a confident expression. That's all for the news for now. Thank you for watching. I'm your host, Risai White. Stay tuned for our next program, where I will report the latest news. With that, the news broadcast ended, and the TV resumed playing the Big Bang Theory in a loop. After watching the news, Dean was lost in thought. Co-sponsoring an exhibition with the Penguin? Was that some kind of century-old joke? Unless Mrs. Chandler had lost her mind, there was no way she would willingly cooperate with the Penguin. The only possibility is that Penguin is forcing her to publicly exhibit the necklace. But the question is, why would the Penguin do this? If he wants the necklace, he could just steal it or buy it directly. It's too simple for him. What good does it do Penguin to simply put a priceless ruby necklace on public display? It seems there's more to it than meets the eye. Dean silently thought to himself. Hey Dean, can I call you Dean? I suddenly remember that I have some important work to do, so I have to go now. At this time, Barbara suddenly told Dean that she had an urgent matter and quickly disappeared. Dean noticed the anxiousness in her expression, but he didn't think much of it, especially since he also had something urgent to do himself. Meanwhile, at the Iceberg Lounge, Penguin finished watching the news on TV, and a satisfied smile appeared on his face. You're so sure that Phantom Thief will fall for it? A shadowy figure in the corner spoke, almost invisible. Humph, <laughs> in Gotham, no one would fall for such a thing. But I'm sure he will come. Penguin smirked coldly and spoke with determination about his plan. It doesn't matter, as long as I take down the Phantom Thief, I'll get $500,000, right? That's all I need to know. The shadowy figure slowly disappeared. A burning Phantom Thief. This might turn out to be an interesting piece of work. Patreon.com slash Sothisque. You can find up to 20 advanced chapters at my Patreon. 6. Chapter 41. The Third Notice Letter. Next. Wayne Manor Batcave. Batgo rode her bat cycle into the Batcave. Meanwhile, Alfred was discussing something with Dick. Hey, Alfred Elf Boots, it looks like I came just in time. What were you guys talking about? Barbara took off her helmet and greeted them. Welcome back, Miss Gordon. Alfred replied with his usual warm smile. Hey, Barbara, are you still investigating the Firefly's escape? Dick asked. Not for the time being. I still haven't found the location of Firefly. This is very unusual. In a city as big as Gotham, he can't move outside without leaving any clues. Someone must have hidden him. Who would have the time to hide a pyromaniac lunatic? Hearing this, Dick rubbed his chin and muttered to himself. Barbara shook her head and said, I don't have a clue yet. There are too many suspects, and it's going to take forever to find out who hid him. So, what brings you here today? Dick looked at Barbara strangely. As the daughter of the commissioner of police and a librarian, Barbara usually kept a low profile and didn't visit the Batcave unless it was necessary. Well, I saw some interesting news not long ago. Barbara told the news she had seen and added her own thoughts. Partnership with Penguin to hold an exhibition? That's a stupid idea. Even if Mrs. Chandler were really old and unstable, she wouldn't make such a decision. There must be something fishy behind this. Barbara confidently said, I think it's probably Penguin who started this. He wanted to use the exhibition to attract someone's attention. After listening to Barbara's words, Dick's expression became strange. When did you become so interested in the Phantom Thief? Didn't I tell you not to get involved in this? Dick observed Barbara warily. But last time, you said that if I the face Phantom Thief in person, I would know what he was capable of. I really want to face this Phantom Thief right now. Barbara shrugged her shoulders, raised the corners of her mouth, and said, Besides, you have already failed to catch to the Phantom Thief twice. This time Penguin is likely to make a lot of noise, I think it is necessary to give you some help. So if Phantom Thief really wants to steal the dragon's egg ruby necklace, then I will get involved. At this time, Alfred who was next to him interrupted and said, Miss Gordon, 
It's great that you are willing to cooperate with Master Richard. We were discussing this matter just now. That's not for you to decide, Alfred. Barbara and I have clear and different responsibilities, and the Phantom Thief is mine. She just needs to focus on her own neighborhood. Dick said it in a hurry, curling his lips unhappily. Wow, it's so rare to see you get emotional. Where did our smart and agile wonder boy go? Barbara exaggeratedly covered her mouth and exclaimed with wide eyes. Humph. Dick snorted and turned his head away. Barbara was amazed by his reaction and turned to Alfred, saying, Alfred, do all boys in their teenage years act like this? I can imagine how difficult it must be for you. He <laughs> he. Alfred chuckled mysteriously. Sometimes, Master Richard does some things that give me a headache. But compared to Master Bruce in the past, he is already a very good behaved child. Hearing this sentence, Barbara's eyes lit up instantly, and she immediately asked, What did Bruce do before? Dick on the side still kept turning his head and sulking, but his ears visibly moved. Seeing that both kids were eager to hear old stories, Alfred began to reminisce. When Master Bruce was fifteen years old he, late at night, Chandler Manor. Unlike Wayne Manor, which appears ancient and rustic, the ancestral home of the Chandler family has been torn down and rebuilt several times over the years. It has been upgraded with the most advanced top materials, such as fireproofing, explosion proofing, and earthquake resistance, making it almost like a fortress. On the other hand, Wayne Manor remains the same old house from a hundred years ago, with even some of the wooden parts even smell musty. However, the inside decorations of both manors are quite similar, focusing on a low-key and ordinary aesthetic. In the room, Mrs. Chandler was sitting on the sofa with a sad face and sorrowful eyes. Compared to when she was in front of the camera, she seems to be more than twenty years older now, and the necklace she often wears around her neck has disappeared. Madam, what did Oswald exactly do to you? Did he steal your necklace? An old housekeeper asked standing before Mrs. Chandler, his eyes filled with sadness and anger. Even if you don't tell me, I can guess that Penguin wants to use you as his revenge tool. He has no idea what that necklace means to you. He's just a shameful thug, a robber, a murderer. He has damaged the reputation of the Cobblepot family. We cannot let him manipulate us. Enough. Mrs. Chandler suddenly became agitated. What can I do? Your curses won't change anything. Oswald's decisions have never changed. When he came to me, I had no other choice. I apologize, madam, for my outburst. The old butler sighed. I'm tired. You may leave now. Mrs. Chandler closed her eyes, her voice calm. Soon, the sound of the door closing echoed through the room. The old butler stands silently at the doorway for a while before finally walking away. Wait. Not long after, Mrs. Chandler suddenly came running out and stopped him. What do you need, madam? The old butler immediately bowed and asked. I have thought about what you said earlier, and you're right. We cannot let the penguin manipulate us. Mrs. Chandler places a hand on the old butler's shoulder, determination on her face. Arrange a car and a driver for me immediately. I'm going to the GCPD to seek help from Commissioner Gordon. Upon hearing her decision, the old butler becomes excited and quickly turns around to make the necessary arrangements. Not long after, the old butler began to feel that something was off. The madam had a look of worry earlier. How did her mood change so quickly? And I didn't hear the sound of the door opening just now. Most importantly, Mrs. Chandler's face seemed younger. The more the old butler thought about it, the more he felt that something was wrong. When he quickly turned around to check, there was no trace of Mrs. Chandler in the hallway. And there was also no sound when the door was opened and closed. Madam, with a loud bang, the old butler hurriedly rushed back into the room. Mrs. Chandler was startled by the sudden return of the old butler. She was about to scold him when her attention was drawn to something on his left shoulder. What is that on your left shoulder? Mrs. Chandler asked curiously. Hearing her question, the old butler instinctively turned his head to look. There, a white card was tucked into his collar. Trembling, the old butler took the card off. On the card were written a few lines, with a cartoon head drawn in the bottom right corner. If 20 multiplied by 3 equals 4, then I will visit at a non-existent time. When Mars has passed its tenth day and night, following the guidance of Caesar, I shall come to claim the blood-stained egg. Sincerely, Phantom Thief. Author's Note. Guys, if we reach 500 Power Stone or someone solved or deciphered this recent notice, I will post three chapters tomorrow. 
This notice is quite difficult especially the first line. Patreon.com slash Sothisku. You can find up to 20 advanced chapters at my Patreon. 8. Audiobook titled DC Phantom Thief Kid Chapter 42-46 by Sithosk. This work belongs to author Sithosk. Source Scribblehub.com Chapter 42 Difficulty The best way to get started is to quit talking and begin doing. Walt Disney A few days later, Phantom Thief's notice reappears. Can he continue to write his own legendary tale after successfully completing two perfect crimes? What's the difference between a thief and a phantom thief? Looking at the phantom thief's two crimes, the first one was where the stolen tears of an angel were successfully returned and are now displayed in the art museum. The second one was where he stole the fake made pink fantasy, providing key evidence to expose the underground money laundering operation. This makes us wonder, is phantom thief really guilty? In these days, some citizens of Gotham have been influenced by Phantom Thief's actions. With some even forming their own fan clubs, there are also people who dress up like the Phantom Thief and participate in street parades. Only for the GCPD to catch them, this means that a trend of admiring the Phantom Thief is silently rising in Gotham. Whether this situation is good or bad, we do not know. Why does Phantom Thief steal? According to psychological experts, there are rumors that the exhibition of the dragon's egg ruby necklace is organized by the infamous Oswald Cobblepot, also known as Penguin, in order to exact revenge for the phantom thief disrupting his money laundering business and the pink fantasy incident is the battle between phantom thief and penguin real or fake? Let's wait and see. Slam. GCPD headquarters, commissioner's office. Jim Gordon angrily slams a few newspapers on the desk, his face dark as if it could drip water. Calm down. Jim why are you getting so worked up over nothing? Beside him, Harvey Bullock calmly tries to console him. Phantom Thief is just going to return whatever he stole anyway. Or the thing he stole was something worthless like a glass bead it hasn't caused any real economic damage to anyone I think we don't need to put so much energy into him just send. A few new officers over to show that we're paying attention. Harvey, how can you say something like that? As soon as Jim hears Harvey's careless words his expression becomes even more unpleasant. Do you even know what I'm worried about? The phantom thief has only appeared for a short time, and already people are imitating him right now, they're just imitating his clothes. But who knows if in the future someone will steal in order to further imitate phantom thief. As the commissioner of the Gotham City Police Department, Gordon actually has his own separate office and doesn't need to be around the frontline detectives. However, Jim himself started as a detective, and he wants Gotham City to change at least a little bit. So even after becoming commissioner, he remains in the GCPD building and always rushes to the front lines whenever there's a case. This is also something that many people don't understand. Why would Commissioner Gordon personally handle a simple theft case and pay so much attention to the Phantom Thief? Yes, the Phantom Thief follows his own set of codes, but what about others? Could people be using the Phantom Thief's name to extort and deceive others? Never underestimate the moral bottom line of Gotham people. That was something you told me before. Jim stared at Harvey with wide eyes. No matter if the phantom thief returns the stolen items or not, he is still a criminal. And when citizens start idolizing a criminal, that's the beginning of the chaos. Don't tell me you've forgotten everything that happened over a decade ago. We can't let a criminal have a huge public influence again. Faced with Jim's emotionally charged outburst, Harvey gave an awkward grin and apologized quickly. All right, all right, I admit you have a point. I have realized the problems with Phantom Thief's growing influence, but should we discuss something else now? Harvey took out a piece of A4 paper with the contents of the Phantom Thief's latest letter on it and placed it on the table with a serious expression. Tomorrow is the first day of the exhibition. If we can't decipher the notice on this today, then we'll have to guard the exhibition tightly for 15 straight days. The GCPD doesn't have the resources to waste this much money. Jim knew Harvey wasn't making things up. There were too many criminal activities in different districts of Gotham, and many police personnel were needed everywhere. In all of Gotham, the total number of police officers of different types exceeded 30,000, but even after being evenly distributed across all precincts, there wasn't enough manpower. Currently, they are not too busy, but the entire Gotham had only about a thousand police officers who could be dispatched, and only a small number of those were elite detectives. These 1,000 officers had to be ready to assist in any serious cases that might happen somewhere. It was impossible to call all of them to deal with the phantom thief. It was particularly important to decipher the notice in advance, 
especially to get the time of the phantom thief's crime, as it could save many police resources. Jim calmed himself down, picked up the notice that phantom thief had faxed to the police station a few days ago, and furrowed his brow. If 20 multiplied by 3 equals 4, then I will visit at a non-existent time. When Mars has passed its tenth day and night, following the guidance of Caesar, I shall come to claim the blood-stained egg. Sincerely, Phantom Thief. Just this first sentence had puzzled Jim for several days. What does it mean for 20 multiplied by 3 to equal 4 foot? Shouldn't it be 60? At what time does that not exist? Doesn't it always mean that there is still an hour between 3 o'clock and 4 o'clock? And what about following the guidance of Caesar? Does it mean that the Phantom Thief has traveled through time? Or has Julius Caesar traveled through time? Could Julius Caesar appear out of nowhere to guide the Phantom Thief? Except for the last sentence, which is about the dragon's egg ruby necklace. The rest of the lines seem like they have 9 out of 10 blocked with just one hole open. At the GCPD, Jim was completely clueless about the notice. On the other side is Wayne Manor, the Batcave. Dick was also pondering how to decipher the Phantom Thief's notice letter. Somehow, he felt that Phantom Thief's ability to write these notices was getting stronger, and each puzzle was more difficult to solve than the last. He looked through a lot of math research reports and academic papers on the back computer, trying to find an explanation for why 20 multiplied by 3 equals 4. If 20 multiplied by 3 equals 4 this sentence must be the key to unlocking the notice letter, Dick firmly believed. But the question remained, under what circumstances would 20 multiplied by 3 equal 4? He studied all mathematical theories and even found many arguments that 1 plus 1 does not equal 2. But he couldn't find any logical explanation for why 20 multiplied by 3 equals 4. There were only two possibilities. First, Phantom Thief made a mistake. But that was clearly impossible. After ruling out all the possibilities, Dick arrived at the final truth. This, it's not a mathematical problem at all. At the same time, at the Gotham City Public Library, Barbara looked at the content of the notice, and a glimmer of excitement quietly appeared in her eyes. Author's note. Give me power stones so that we can reach heaven. Patreon.com slash Sothisk. You can find up to 20 advanced chapters at my Patreon. 5. Chapter 43. First day of the exhibition. Hurt me with the truth but never comfort me with a lie. Urza Scarlet. Fairy tale. The sentence that reads, 20 times 3 equals 4, is what most people notice when they look at Phantom Thief's notice letter. They think that if they can figure out this sentence, they will be able to figure out all of the notice's clues. However, Barbara had a different perspective. When she couldn't figure out why 20 multiplied by 3 would equal 4, it meant that there was still another extra puzzle hidden within the sentence itself. In other words, it wasn't important whether 20 multiplied by 3 would equal 4. What's important is what these three numbers, 20, 3, and 4, represent. And what does the word multiply represent? Barbara shifted her focus to the third and fourth sentences of the notice. Mars and Caesar, one is the god of war in Roman mythology, and the other is the dictator of the Roman Empire Rome Rome Rome. After pondering for a while, Barbara suddenly remembered the introduction to Greco-Roman polytheism in the religious section of the library. And she also remembered Dean Sutton from the last time she saw him at the library reading it. Could it be a coincidence? Barbara thought suspiciously. I didn't think there was anything unusual when we met last time, but now that I think about it, why would a young magician prodigy be interested in Greco-Roman religious studies? The more she thought about it, the more something seemed off. Barbara's gaze sharpened as she headed to the bookshelf where she had met Dean before, took out the research introduction, and flipped through it. However, after a quick scan, besides information about the Roman god of war, Mars, Barbara did not find any relevant clues to decipher the notice. It seems like I'm just being paranoid he couldn't possibly. Barbara chuckled and placed the book back on the shelf. Hmm? Just then, the corner of Barbara's eye caught sight of another book on the shelf. The Negative Impact of the European Church on Cultural Development On March 1st, the first day of the Dragon's Egg Ruby Necklace Exhibition. The exhibition venue was the Gotham Natural History Museum. This was the city's biggest museum, with 13 exhibition halls that all connected to each other each with five floors and dozens of large exhibition rooms. Mrs. Chandler's necklace was placed on the top floor of the Central Cultural Exhibition Hall. Today, there were more visitors to the museum than usual. In the past, there were almost no visitors now that it has only been open for two hours, it has already shown signs of a huge crowd. It's unclear whether it was because of the dragon's egg ruby necklace due to its fame, 
and everyone wanted to see what it looked like, or if it was because they wanted to see how Phantom Thief would steal the necklace. Over 200 undercover officers from the GCPD kept close watch around the cultural exhibition hall, monitoring every visitor who came. Inside the exhibition hall, nearly a hundred police officers were spread out at different locations on the five floors. The show of control was pretty impressive, and even visitors followed the rules without even thinking about it. In addition to the cultural exhibition hall, the other exhibition halls also had different numbers of officers assigned to them to act as a roaming task force for timely support, if needed. This time, the GCPD sent out more people than they ever had before but Jim still didn't think it was safe enough. They temporarily brought in two police helicopters to patrol the museum. If Phantom Thief tried to surprise them with a glider, the helicopter rotor's airflow would teach him a lesson. However, this time, the police didn't use the face-squeezing method to verify if the visitors were pretending to be Phantom Thief. The exhibition would last for 15 days, and they couldn't be sure when the Phantom Thief would sneak in. If they squeezed every visitor's face for 15 days in a row, it would cause public dissatisfaction. If handled poorly, it could even lead to a fight. This is definitely not the situation Jim wants to see. Therefore, the police could only work hard on surveillance. At this moment, a beautiful young redhead girl walked into the Natural History Museum. As she entered the square, she spotted a familiar figure wearing a cowboy hat leading a patrol team. Hey, Harvey. Barbara walked over and greeted Harvey. Oh, hey, Barbara. Are you here to visit your Uncle Harvey? Harvey turned around and smiled happily when he heard Barbara's voice he had known Jim for many years and had watched Barbara grow up. For some reason, he was still single, and deep down, he might have considered Barbara his own daughter. I'd love to humor you and say yes, but I'm sorry, that's not why I'm here I came for one purpose only, and that is to see Phantom Thief. Barbara teased playfully, blinking her eyes. Hush. Suddenly, Harvey made a gesture to silence her and exaggeratedly said, Be careful don't let your dad hear your words he's so sick of Phantom Thief. It's driving him nuts. Don't worry, Uncle Harvey. I know very well how much my dad hates Phantom Thief. I suspect if he wasn't afraid of being reported for disturbing the quiet at night, he would spend the whole night criticizing Phantom Thief. Barbara chuckled in amazement. Anyway, I'm going to go to the exhibition and see what Phantom Thief wants to steal, so I won't bother you to continue patrolling. After separating from Harvey and others, Barbara's mischievous and cute smile vanished in an instant, replaced by seriousness and determination. She calmly took out an earphone and put it on, and a slightly eager voice came through. Have you entered the museum? Obviously, yes. At the same time, in the senior year classroom of Gotham Academy, Dick wore a pair of earphones in his ears. He was having a hidden conversation with Barbara, and he was doing it in the middle of a class. Gotham's private high school was relatively open-minded and did not exactly restrict students from using electronic devices. It was normal to see students wearing earphones and using phones, tablets, and even laptops in class. As long as the students believed that these devices improved their learning efficiency, they were allowed. However, the condition was that when the teacher called on you to answer a question, you had to be able to provide an accurate answer instead of being clueless. Otherwise, it would be seen as a disrespectful attitude towards learning, and your electronic devices would be confiscated on the spot. Therefore, Dick's wearing earphones in the classroom didn't draw much attention. He kept his voice very low, just enough for Barbara and himself to hear, while everyone else around couldn't hear what he was saying. Even Dean, who was sitting in front of him, couldn't hear his voice with his ears. But the interesting thing is that Dean also wears an earphone on his left ear. Author's Note Patreon.com slash Sothisk. You can find up to 20 advanced chapters at my Patreon. 4. Chapter 44 Suspicion Even if we forget the faces of our friends, we will never forget the bonds that were carved into our souls. Yuzuru Otanashi, Angel Beats In the back row near the window, Dean listened to the faint voice coming through his earphones and thought to himself. Dick sent someone to the museum. How could Dean hear Dick's conversation? In fact, the method was quite simple. All Dean had to do was crack the electromagnetic frequency that matched Dick and Barbara's phone call, and with a set of techniques, he could easily listen in on conversations. Of course, Dean didn't have that level of hacking expertise yet, and he didn't have the important tools at the moment. In fact, Dean had installed a small bug that looked like a piece of gum on the opposite side of Dick's desk. It was not the first day for Dean to eavesdrop on Dick. As early as the day he appeared as the Phantom Thief, Dean had already started to keep a close eye on Dick. 
He would come to school early in the morning to install the bug and bring it back after school. It was a very bold and risky move. Once Dick finds out about the bug, or if Dick has some strange habit of touching under the desk, the situation will be very bad for Dean. But on the other hand, Dean knew that so far Dick had still trusted him up to this point. And over the years of knowing each other, Dean had never seen Dick check under the desk. Even if Dick accidentally found the bug, Dean could come up with a prank with sticky gum to gamble his way out, although it would be difficult. In short, Dean thought it was worth the risk to learn about Dick's secret life as Robin, even if there was only a small chance that he could learn something useful. As it turned out, Dean was more right in his bet. Who was Dick talking to, Alfred? Unfortunately, the bug only picked up Dick's voice and not the voices in his earpiece. Dean stayed quiet and seemed to pay attention in class but he was really focusing on Dick. On the other side, Barbara casually walked around the exhibition as an ordinary visitor. Did you figure out the riddle already that you were so eager for me to come to the museum and investigate? Barbara quietly asked Dick. I've only deciphered one part. Dick paused for a moment, then answered. When Mars has passed its tenth day, it means that Phantom Thief will move on March 11th. Mars, the god of war in Roman mythology, is the origin of the word March after past its tenth day. It means exactly 10 days, which is March 11th. Barbara wasn't surprised that Dick had deciphered this line, as she had also deciphered it, and even more than what Dick had solved. You know that Phantom Thief won't move until the 11th, so why did you ask me to come on the first day? Don't you know how busy I am with work every day? Dick twitched the corners of his mouth as if he had never been to the library he pretended not to hear and continued. I've fought with Phantom Thief twice before although he waits until the set time. It doesn't mean that he will only come to the scene at that time. Phantom Thief's every move is fast and accurate, with a strong purpose, and his escape routes are all planned, which shows that he is very familiar with the location this much information can't be learned in just a few hours. Dick said earnestly, I'm sure Phantom Thief starts observing the target location several days or even weeks before he takes action. Today is the first day of the exhibition and also the first day that GCPD has settled in a large area the Phantom Thief is likely to observe the police positions from this point. You might be able to find some clues. I still have three days of classes before I can have a two-day break so it's difficult for me to leave and go to the museum. So you want me to come? It seems like you've learned some lessons from dealing with Phantom Thief. After hearing Dick's words, Barbara finally understood why this kid asked her to come to the museum early in the morning. There's actually a more important reason. At this moment, Dick suddenly spoke with a serious tone. During the auction at Gotham International Hotel, Phantom Thief sent me a challenge card to Robin. But at that time, I was Dick Grayson, not Robin. Upon hearing this, Barbara's expression changed suddenly. Are you saying that the Phantom Thief knows who you are? Why didn't you tell me this important information earlier? You should have told me that day. What about Bruce and Alfred? What about me? Have we all been exposed? Dick said in a deep voice. Honestly, I'm not sure at least Phantom Thief hasn't used our identities to threaten us or shown any signs of revealing this information to others I don't think he's a completely bad person. Listening to Dick's words, Barbara couldn't help but think of Dean. She suddenly asked, Dick, do you know Dean Sutton? Dean? He's my classmate, why do you bring him up? Dick asked in confusion. I ran into him at the library a few days ago and he was reading works on Greek and Roman religions now the new notice letter from Phantom Thief clearly has Roman parts in. Addition, he's a young and famous magician don't you think it's too much of a coincidence? Barbara whispered. You suspect Dean is the Phantom Thief? Dick raised an eyebrow and chuckled, I know Dean, and he couldn't possibly do those things. At that moment, sitting at the table in front of Dick, Dean suddenly felt a sense of guilt for some reason. Hmm. I guess it's because I've been eating too many carbs and fats lately. I need to maintain a low body fat percentage. After making a decision in his heart, Dean continued eavesdropping on Dick's conversation. I know you're friends with Dean, and honestly, I don't have a bad impression of him I don't want to suspect him, but it's just too coincidental. Barbara suggested to Dick, we both don't want Dean to be the phantom thief, so I've decided to give you an important task it's not because I suspect him, but to prove Dean's innocence. After hearing Barbara's suggestion, Dick hesitated a bit on his face. But in the end, Barbara's suspicion was reasonable. All right, I agree with your idea. Dick wasn't a hesitant person, so once he figured things out, he immediately agreed. Don't worry, we won't wrongly accuse anyone who's innocent by the way. At this moment, Barbara asked with a playful look in her eyes, 
Do you want to know the real meaning behind 20 multiplied by 3 equals 4 foot? Author's note. Keep supporting me guys and drop power stone. We will reveal the answer tomorrow. Enjoy. Patreon.com slash Sothisk. You can find up to 20 advanced chapters at my Patreon. 6. Chapter 45. The Meaning of the Notice Letter. What's the point of living, if all we do is hurt each other? Thorfinn, Vinland Saga. When Dick heard Barbara's words, his pupils instantly shrank. You mean to say you've already figured it out? Dick asked anxiously. Well, what do you think? If I hadn't figured it out, wouldn't it be meaningless for me to ask you? Barbara smirked and said, You must be racking your brains to solve the riddle in the notice. And you can't wait to know what it means, am I right? Stop teasing me, just tell me already. Dick urged impatiently. Seeing that he was in such a hurry, Barbara stopped teasing and became serious. Do you know Roman numerals? Roman numerals? Of course, I know them, but what does that have to do with the riddle in the notice letter? Dick scowled and questioned. But even using Roman counting, 20 multiplied by 3 still doesn't equal 4. That's because the real values of 20, 3, and 4 are not what they appear to be. They may not represent specific numbers, but rather an order of numbers, Barbara explained. An order of numbers? Dick questioned. Barbara reminded him. Do you still remember the seven basic symbols of Roman numerals? I1, V5, X10, L50, C100, D500, M1000, and so on. As Dick recalled these seven symbols, a flash of ideas came to him. If we consider 20, 3, and 4 as an order of numbers in alphabetical letters, it means we need to convert them into the matching letters and then replace them into the Roman numerals. Hmm? Wait, that doesn't make sense. Just as he was halfway through the idea, a puzzled expression appeared on Dick's face. If we solve them based on alphabetical numbers, then 3 as C would be equal to 100 and 4 as D would be equal to 500 but 20 as T, which isn't one of the basic symbols of Roman numerals. Hearing this, Barbara's eyes flashed, and she said it meaningfully. According to Roman mythology, polytheism is considered traditional and was slowly replaced by Christianity starting from the time of Constantine the Great it became a remnant of. Ancient Rome Indiana the Riddle the mention of Mars and Caesar symbolizes ancient Roman culture. It seems that Phantom Thief is showing us that we need to solve it using knowledge of ancient Rome. We need to replace the numbers with Roman numerals and the letters with the letters from the Roman period. In ancient Rome, there were no letters J, U, and W. In other words, the order of numbers for the 20th letter in the alphabet is not T but V. When we use Roman numerals, its actual value is the number 5. 20 multiplied by 3 equals 4 foot means V multiplied by C equals D, which solves 5 multiplied by 100 equals 500, a perfect match. At this point, Dick suddenly understood, and his thoughts became clear. If 20 multiplied by 3 equals 4, then I will visit at a non-existent time, when Mars passes its 10th day and night, following the guidance of Caesar, I shall come to claim the blood-stained egg. If the intention of the first sentence is Roman numerals, then the non-existent time mentioned in the second line means midnight because there is no zero in Roman numerals. Without further explanation from Barbara, Dick solved the meaning of the following sentence. Looking at the first three lines together, Phantom Thief will move at midnight on March 11th, which is 12 o'clock on March 10th. At this point Dick frowned. But what does following the guidance of Caesar mean? I haven't figured out this sentence yet if this sentence is just meant to guide us to focus on ancient Roman-related knowledge. Then it seems unnecessary because mentioning Mars would serve the same purpose. After hearing this, Dick nodded in agreement. He also felt that this sentence was not just a simple hint. But, Barbara suddenly changed the subject. After coming to the Natural History Museum, I think I understand what he means. Inside the ancient Rome exhibition hall, Barbara looked at a sculpture of Julius Caesar, and her eyes flashed with a hint of understanding. The statue of Julius Caesar appeared as if he were pointing towards the enemy when he was leading the army. If Barbara remembered correctly, the direction the statue was pointing should be towards the jungle exhibition hall on the east side of the museum, where the dragon egg ruby necklace is located. Are you suggesting that Caesar's guidance is just an actual guide and that phantom thief will carry out his plan at midnight on March 10th in the jungle exhibition hall? After listening to Barbara's thoughts, Dick asked with doubt. I know it sounds a bit direct, but at least for now, it's the only explanation that makes sense I haven't found any other guidance of Caesar here. Barbara shook her head and sighed. All right, it seems that there is no other way to solve the puzzle in short. The time will never be wrong. 
After thinking for a while, they realized that this was really only one explanation. Dick nodded, agreeing with Barbara's thoughts. So far, the two of them have deciphered the entire content of Phantom Thief's notice letter. After discussing some details of the follow-up arrangements, Dick ended his call with Barbara. At that moment, Dick suddenly heard someone calling his name from ahead. Hey, Dick, Dick, snap out of it. Mrs. Anderson is coming to find you. Dean was calling his name softly while all the classmates looked at him with amused eyes. Dick's heart skipped a beat as he instantly realized something was wrong. It seems you've finally come to your senses. Mr. Grace and I called your name four times already, and you did not respond at all. I have to question whether your attitude towards learning is good. A deep voice from a middle-aged woman came from beside him. Dick's face immediately stiffened as he looked up and met Mrs. Anderson's gloomy expression. Mrs. Anderson was their math teacher and had a bad temper. Dick realized that the situation was not good. He had been too focused on discussing the notice letter with Barbara and completely missed being called. Can you give me a reasonable explanation, Mr. Grayson? Mrs. Anderson asked slowly and deliberately, her eyes filled with pressure. Dick's face broke into a cold sweat as he forced a smile and said, A Mrs. Anderson. I was just listening to your class and got completely immersed in the world of mathematics until a few seconds ago. Mrs. Anderson stared into his eyes without any expression. What you said can only deceive yourself, not anyone else I think I'll have to confiscate your earphones now, and if you get distracted again, I'll have to talk seriously with Mr. Wayne about your education. After finishing speaking, Mrs. Anderson took away Dick's earphones without any further words and returned to the stage. Author's Note Help me guys reach heaven and keep sending me power stones, winky face. Patreon.com slash Sothisk. You can find up to 20 advanced chapters on my Patreon. 2. Chapter 46. The Riddler. Next. Humans aren't made perfectly everyone lies even so. I've been careful not to tell lies that hurt others. Like Yagami. Ha 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 ha. As Mrs. Anderson left, Dick heard a burst of laughter around him. He knew that his classmates were laughing at him because his earphones had been taken away. Luckily, he had just finished his call with Barbara, or else it would have caused even more trouble. Of course, if the call hadn't ended, Dick wouldn't have let Mrs. Anderson take away the earphones. With Dick's reaction, he could have removed the earphones before Mrs. Anderson touched them. It's just that there is no need for that now, and it's not a big deal if the earphones are taken away. Hey, what were you listening to that got you so immersed? Dean turned around and quietly asked. A nothing special, just a few new rock songs. Dick scratched the back of his head and laughed. Really? I never knew you liked rock. Dean glanced at Dick with his usual expression and warned, Be careful, Mrs. Anderson has her eyes on you. After speaking, he turned around and sat straight. No one noticed that there was a chewing gum-like object in Dean's hand. That's right. While Mrs. Anderson was taking away Dick's headphones, Dean quietly took back the bug stuck on the back of the table with lightning speed. He had almost heard the entire conversation between Dick and Barbara. From his suspicions about his own identity to the solving of the notice letter, Dean already knew everything. The only downside was that he couldn't hear Barbara's voice, so he couldn't be sure who he was talking to. In any case, it must be one of Batman's people, either the butler Alfred or the Batgirl, whose true identity is still unknown. In short, they have already started to suspect me as the Phantom Thief, and Dick's level of suspicion towards me is not too deep, which means the person he was talking to is the one who truly suspects me. But they probably don't have any evidence to identify me, they are still just guessing otherwise. Dick's attitude wouldn't be like this. Dean thought to himself, in their next move, they will surely try to test me. Meanwhile, deep inside Arkham Asylum, in a cell with heavy iron doors tightly locked and high-strength iron bars added to the windows. Two men, one tall and one short, sit facing each other. The tall, skinny man's hands are handcuffed to the table, restricting his movement. He's also wearing orange inmate clothing. Clearly, he must be a mentally ill criminal who's been imprisoned here. What's strange is that there is no number written on his inmate clothes instead. There's a mysterious question mark symbol drawn on it. Sitting opposite him was a short, Chubby man with a long, pointed nose, dressed in a tuxedo and holding an umbrella cane. In Gotham City, there is only one person who fits this description. Penguin, Oswald Cobblepot. In the dimly lit cell, the faces of the two men are barely visible, giving off a sinister and terrifying vibe. An indescribable chill affects the entire room, 
which makes the two fully armed guards disguised as nurses standing at the door shiver. Well, Nigma, any idea? After a long time, the penguin was the first to speak, mentioning a name that would surely strike fear into the hearts of every Gotham citizen. Edward Nigma, standing at six feet two inches tall and thirty-five years old, is a highly intelligent supervillain suffering from a severe mental illness. He is extremely narcissistic about his own intelligence and enjoys using his high IQ to manipulate others. But rather than being called by his real name, he prefers to be called a Riddler. Not long ago, Penguin visited Arkham Asylum to visit the Riddler. At first, the people in charge of the asylum didn't want to let in another notorious criminal. However, all the necessary government documents were in order, so the institution had no reason to keep him outside. The condition was that he could only enter alone and without any personal belongings. At the same time, he had two prison guards or, I mean nurses, who were always with him and never left his side. When Penguin came to see to face with the Riddler, he asked him a few questions, hoping that the Riddler could help him figure out their meaning. That's right, it was the notice letter from the Phantom Thief since he couldn't bring any items into Arkham. Penguin could only talk about it with Riddler. Penguin is pressuring Mrs. Chandler to hold an exhibition to seek revenge against the Phantom Thief. If he knows the Phantom Thief's next move, he can set up a perfect trap and take him down on the spot. There's just one problem the Phantom Thief's notice is too difficult to decipher. Barbara was able to decipher the notice because she happened to remember a book that Dean had read that day, which inspired her. Otherwise, Barbara's progress might not be any faster than Dick's, and she would still be stuck on the line Mars past its tenth day and night. For most people, without the important hints, it's almost impossible to figure out how to decipher the notice and Penguin was no exception. However, Penguin isn't worried about not being able to solve the notice because he has his own way. If he can't figure it out, he'll have someone else do it. So Penguin approached Riddler, who in his opinion, is the best person in the world at riddles. At this moment, Penguin is eagerly waiting for Riddler's response. Interesting. This riddle is very interesting, and I like it. Who came up with it? Seeing Riddler close his eyes and think, a crazy joy slowly appeared on his face as if he were a child who had just received his favorite toy. Penguin didn't understand his joy, and he didn't want to understand he just wanted to know what the notice meant. I'm glad you like the gift I brought you, old friend. So now please tell me, have you figured out this riddle? Penguin asked. Oh, hearing this, Riddler suddenly changed his face and sneered disdainfully. When I say it's interesting, I mean the design of this puzzle makes me feel fresh not because I think it's difficult. In fact, if I were to rate it according to difficulty, it wouldn't even qualify as a decent riddle in my eyes. The time is midnight on March 10th, the location I see if it really is the Natural History Museum, and if I'm not mistaken, it's the Jungle Exhibition Hall. The Riddler quickly revealed all the answers to Penguin. I won't bother explaining the reason to you, Oswald, as I know you don't care. Penguin grinned and said, You're still as smart as ever I only need the result the process is not important. I'm glad to see you today, old friend, but visiting hours are over, so I have to go now. Wait. Riddler stopped Penguin and fixed his gaze on him, asking, Tell me, who is this person? He calls himself Phantom Thief, a thief who likes to show off. Penguin turned slightly and replied with his eyes with a hint of killing intent, which fell into the eyes of Riddler, but it was not directed at him. You don't need to take this person seriously, Nigma, because ten days from now, you won't have the chance to meet him again. Author's note, keep supporting me guys and drop Power Stone, we will reach the heavens someday in joy. Patreon.com slash You can find up to 20 advanced chapters at my Patreon. 1.